topic we have is about recent advances, and the speaker for today is Dr. Aparna Sharma. I request Dr. Jyoti Bhaskar to introduce the speaker. We have the chairpersons, Dr. Renu. We will have the chairpersons also. Okay, chairpersons for today's session is Dr. First is Dr. Professor Deepika Deka. Uh, she is a senior consultant, fetal medicine and genetics at Cloud Nine Hospital, Guru Gurugram. She is pre presently. Pre President of Delhi Gynecologist Forum Dwarka. Formerly, she was professor and head of OBGY, Chief Maternal Fetal Medicine at AIMS. She has many publications in national and international journals, and she has edited many textbooks. She is recipient of various FOXI and uh, other awards. Oh, and the next speaker we have, welcome Dr. Deepika Deka, ma'am. Next uh, expert we have is Dr. Raj Bukaria. Dr. Raj Bokaria is a senior cons consultant at Fortis Lapam and Max Purpurgan Hospital. She is past president of EDGF and uh, she is founder member of DGS and has organized many endoscopic workshops. Next expert we have is Dr. Deepti Nab. Ma'am, Dr. Deepti Nab is director, mother and child center. She is vice president of EDGF. She is past secretary of EDGF. She has many awards to her credit. Welcome Dr. Deepti Nab, ma'am. Over to Dr. Parna for her deliberation. Uh, so, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Renu, and very good evening to all of you. And uh, good evening, Shada Jan, ma'am. It's really my pleasure to be here uh, once again. And uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, stillbirths, uh, recent advances. So, uh, yes, is my slide visible? Is visible. Yes. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. So, uh, when it's I talk, yeah. yes, that's fine. It okay? it's fine. Perfect. Right. So, actually, I asked myself. See, I had taken this talk uh, previously, and then I asked myself this question that you know, why should I talk about stillbirth uh, to this gathering? And uh, what do I actually want to know about stillbirths? I am not an epidemiologist, so I am not too much into data. I would not like, you know, as a clinician, I myself would not be okay in some numbers, but not too much. I'm not into policy making because stillbirth seems to be one of the favorite topics for the policy makers now. So, but I'm a clinician. So what do I want to know regarding stillbirth? So first, of course, I'd like to think about how to define it. Of course, how common is it? Why does it happen? If it has happened, then what should I do next in terms of, you know, the testing? And what should I do in terms of managing this pregnancy? And of course, I have this thing in my mind that how can we prevent this? And I think the last point is quite important on how to prevent it. So when I talk about uh, fetal death is when a fetus is does not show any signs of life. So important definition here is embryonic is less than 12 early fetal is 13 to 19 intermediate is 20 to 27 plus 6 and when we talk about fetal deaths we generally talk about the late fetal deaths that is more than 28 weeks of gestation and who defines fetal death as intrauterine death of a fetus at any time during pregnancy and for international comparison it is recommended that to define stillbirth as a baby who's both with no signs of life at or after 28 weeks so 28 weeks is a cutoff so now this particular timeline which has been given in the who guideline talks about less than 22 weeks we need to call it an abortion or a miscarriage so less than 22 weeks before period of viability is miscarriage less than 28 weeks is early stillbirth more than 28 weeks is late stillbirth or the international comparison definition that is more than one kg more than 28 weeks and this is the category that is overall compared antepartum before the onset of labor intrapartum after the onset of labor and this continues into the perinatal death when you talk about the death within seven days and extended perinatal is when you have talk about death within 28 days so these terminologies have to be very clear because we need to understand what is the etiology behind all of these things and of course fresh stillbirth is when the baby is born without signs of uh, disintegration that is less than 12 hours and more than 12 hours some signs do appear although they do have a progression 
Now, there are other definitions of stillbirth. Now, with the increasing capability of our nurseries to support the you know, smaller babies also, the WHO ICD statistics and registration definition says that if it is more than 22 weeks or if it is more than 500 gram, it is called a stillbirth. And this definition we use here in AIMS also. So for all international comparison, it is more than 28 weeks. For the statistics and registration beyond fetal viability, you would call a baby who's born more than 500 gram or also a stillbirth. So that is the basic definitions that we should be aware of before we go on to manage a case. Now, how common is it? So a little bit of epidemiology. So stillbirth is actually the number of stillbirths per thousand total birth. So it is a valuable indicator of the health status and high corresponds, of course, to the poor quality of maternal health. And it was 14.5 uh, in 2009. There is something called a prospective rate of fetal death. That is number of fetal deaths at a given gestation age per thousand births. So we see that it is high initially. In from 29 to 37 weeks, it is the lowest. And beyond 37, 38 weeks, again, it starts rising. So the gestational risk of stillbirth, as a, in, even in its natural course, will increase as the gestation increases after 38 weeks. So this is the latest document which came out in 2021, which looked at the stillbirths, uh, which has been falling from approximately 21.4 in 2000 to 13.9 in 2019. So if you look at this particular table, definitely the global has fallen down from 21 to 13.9. And India is the largest contributor to stillbirths and it has come down from 32 to 18. So although if you see the percentage decline is the highest, we have a 43.4% decline. And yet India is one of the biggest contributors to stillbirths. So this country, the blue country here, talks about a stillbirth rate between 12 to 20 per thousand total births. So India is a country where we have the largest number of stillbirths. So it is topping the wrong chart where 0.34 million of the 1.9 million stillbirths globally in 2019 were in India. Of course, COVID contributed a bit to the increase in number, but still we have the biggest country with the largest number of the stillbirths. So now we come to the most important question on why is the stillbirth happening? So the etiology. So we can understand from common sense and also from our prior knowledge that it could be maternal, placental, fetal infections and unexplained. Now, within the maternal causes, what are our important maternal causes? causes? Of course, it increases with age. Then we have the intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy. We have diabetes, autoimmune disorders and APLA. So all of these things are the maternal causes which contribute to stillbirth. Fetal causes, I would say, for our practical purposes, we have to understand and manage fetal growth restriction. Of course, rest of the other things, we cannot really change too much. Complications of multifetal pregnancy requiring a lot of monitoring, alloy immunization, genetic problems, and fetal high drops resulting from various other causes. So fetal causes, what we can do about is the growth restriction. Placental causes, again, it could be sudden causes like placental abruption, utroplacental insufficiency resulting in growth restriction, other placental pathologies which are not very common, and umbilical cord complications. Infections, of course, uh, they are a major chunk which cause uh, stillbirth. Out of this, the torch group of infections remain an important cause of stillbirth. Intrapartum, of course, we have the various events that occur during labor and hence labor monitoring is something that is very, very important. So the causes would include abruption, obstructed labor, cord prolapse, malpresentation, uterine rupture, fetal distress, or some other cause that we are not aware of. However, 50% of the stillbirths are unexplained, and it could not be attributed to any identified viable fetal cause or maternal cause. And it is more common near term, as we saw from the curve, that the rate would increase as the uh, baby would ap approach more than 38 weeks. Now, this particular document from ACOG and a combined document from SMFM talks about a 2020 article which talks about management of still stillbirth and it's a very simplified document. So if we talk about so because this rate is 6.4 is because this is an American document. If we have to think about ourselves, it's almost close to 18. But even in their condition, if you talk about diabetes, that increases the risk, hypertensive disorder. 
and growth restricted fetus the risk is increased almost you know four to five times when you have a growth restricted fetuses multiple pregnancy increases the risk oligohydramnios a previous stillbirth will increase the risk renal disease cholestasis again significant increase in risk advanced maternal age of more than 35 or 40 years increases the risk and again very young age art conception obese woman and smoking so all of these things they do in increase the risk of stillbirth when we talk about that now classification is something that is uh, you know very important to understand why this thing happen so in fact there are more than 35 classification systems only for stillbirth but most commonly most acceptable is who icd pm classification which was given in 2016 now this was the recode classification which divided that into fetus umbilical placenta fluid uterus mother intrapartum trauma and unclassified it was given by gardosi in 2005 but we are not using this very commonly what we are using and what we are supposed to use is the icd pm classification which came in 2016 so it talked about antepartum death so out six causes where you have malformation infection hypoxia you have the intrapartum death where you can have the malformations birth trauma acute event infection disorders related to fetal growth or the neonatal death so antepartum and intrapartum component they specify the stillbirths and we should classify try and classify the stillbirths according to these because this help us in um, managing things further and of course we need to understand the maternal background condition which is there like maternal complications other complications medical or surgical condition so when we try to classify stillbirth we should follow this system where you have to classify antepartum intrapartum and what is the category of antepartum and intrapartum stillbirth along with the background maternal condition now this particular article actually tried to look at you know how useful are the various classification systems and they actually looked at 31 classification systems 14 for perinatal death and they said that all of them required clinical records but one third they also used histology and autopsy and they said that if you actually use all of this then only less than 1% you the cause remains unknown but if you do not use that and you you only use clinical records you can have 50% as unidentified like we previously said that okay 50% of the stillbirths are unknown etiology so the success depends on the availability of clinical information and how well we have looked into the laboratory investigations and investigated for the cause so this now we understand that it's very important to look into the detail of the causes and that is why it's important to know what are the investigations we should do when we have a stillbirth so evaluation of course first we need to establish a diagnosis the patient comes with decreased fetal movements on the fetal heart is not audible and there is gradual retrogression of the height of the uterus you establish the diagnosis by an ultrasound nothing much to talk about it x ray is now obsolete so when we investigate the cause first is a detailed history of the mother and which should and the family which should include any history of previous abortions venous thromboembolism hereditary condition previous developmental delay then you have the maternal history of diabetes hypertension thrombophilia sle epilepsy severe anemia so any maternal condition that is to be there then you have to take a detailed obstetric history on previous miscarriages any previous maternal conditions which were associated with the previous pregnancies previous placental abruption and previous fetal demise in the current pregnancy we know we should be seeing the maternal age what is the age at stillbirth was there is cholestasis i think this is one of the most common uh, causes which it goes undetected pregnancy weight gain complications of a twin pregnancy abruption trauma or any preterm labor or rupture of membrane so all of these history becomes very important when we are investigating the cause along with a general physical examination including a detailed per speculum and a per vaginal examination now investigating the cause we should be looking at the maternal blood group a detailed C- cbc lft kft coagulation profile if you don't know when the stillbirth happened then of course we need to look into the urine albumin and ultrasound for the detail if there was any retro placental clot so there are certain investigations that we do for the maternal evaluation at the time of demise so that should include if we suspecting maternal fetal hemorrhage 
or syphilis anti phospholipid antibodies indirect and then all of the uh, so, so, so one more important point i'd like to mention here is that you know we get carried away and start you know testing for a lot of other things but a routine testing for inherited thrombophilias is not recommended unless there is a history of thromboembolic disease in the family and of course you we should be looking at icd glucose screening and toxicology screening if it has not been done previously and if we are suspecting a large baby and we see that it's a large for gestational age baby and with polyhydramnios so we should also look for the glucose oral gtt gtt now most important part that is under uh, performed is the evaluation of stillbirth so first of all we describe the infant if there is any obvious malformation scanning of the stain degree of maceration how is the baby looking the baby is hydropic or pale or the baby is big baby is small amniotic fluid what was the color meconium blood was the fluid there at all polyhydramnios oligohydramnios umbilical cord whether there was cord prolapse entanglement hematoma number of vessels and the length of the cord and the placenta should be weighed looked for staining adherent loss structural abnormalities velamentous insertion edema and hydropic changes we should also look at the membranes for staining and thickening so when we inspect the fetus it is important not just to look at it but take some measurements like the weight head circumference length of the fetus weight of the placenta photographs the frontal and the profile photograph document finding so what we understand is that all of us are not geneticists but if something has happened something that we do today can help diagnose the problem in the future we can send the patient with all of these documents to a geneticist so that you know we can uh, come to some conclusion what is important is what are the cytogenetic specimens that should be taken with the sterile technique so amniotic fluid by amniocentesis at the time of prenatal diagnosis is a preferable medium a placental block of 1 into 1 cm taken from below the cord insertion site on the unfixed placenta this has to be taken umbilical cord segment of 1.5 cm any internal fetal tissue such as the costochondral junction patella or the skin is not recommended now place the specimens in a sterile tissue culture medium of lactated ringer solution and keep at room temperature so this is something that we need to understand do not place the specimens in formalin so some of the important points that if unfortunately these things have happened how can we help make a diagnosis of the reason for this stillbirth and obtain parental consent if it is they are allowing fetal autopsy and placental pathology however if the consent is not given there are other options like x ray imaging mri so we in aims have a minimally invasive autopsy protocol where the patients if do not give a consent then an mri is done and then uh, various details are obtained based on the mri so the purpose is when we want to look at the fetal and placental microbiology we want to rule out fetal infections which is more informative than maternal serology when we are taking the fetal tissues we need to look at we want to know the genetic disorders and when we the postmortem examination of course is going to give us the highest diagnostic yield but the problem is most of the uh, people might not give consent so when we take the specimen the fetal blood 1 to 2 3 ml for uh, culture in heparin and 5 ml for infection screening fetal lung tissues are to be sent if the, if they are uh, taken they are to be sent for viral studies placenta using a sterile swab below the amnion for culture and if we are taking the fetal tissues it can be obtained by washing with sterile saline and removing 2 cm with the underlying dermis so these techniques so even if you know immediately that we are not able to contact the uh, genetics is something that we can help in the future stored in normal saline and refrigerator and should not be frozen so <clears throat> some of the specimens can be collected even you know uh, by everyone and can be taken up later for evaluation now again a limited autopsy which includes if the consent is not given for full autopsy it can be done now the most important part is when do we go for a detailed genetic testing when we have a congenital malformation if we have an early onset severe foot fetal growth restriction not the late fetal growth restriction not necessarily if we have a non immune hydrops ambiguous genitalia dysmorphic features or a parent carrier of a balanced chromosomal trans uh, rearrangement so if the, all of these things are present we have to do the genetic testing now the question is which genetic testing should we be doing 
so the specimens so 6% will have some chromosomal abnormality now that we can take amniocentesis and placenta for cytogenetics and karyotypic an, uh, analysis should be performed in all cases of stillbirth after appropriate parental permission now amniocentesis as we discussed has the higher seal and if you are taking the placenta the umbilical cord closest to the placenta should be taken fetal cart cartilage can be obtained from the costochondral junction this not everybody agrees on this part but conventional geneticists would like to take this part of the fetal cartilage for analysis now routine assessment for single gene defects and micro deletions currently is not recommended uh, but what it has been seen that you know when we are doing a genetic analysis for the cases of stillbirth you could find chromosomal abnormalities in 13% of the fetal deaths and success rates is higher for invasive that is prenatal diagnostic testing than the postpartum tissue analysis now this postpartum tissue analysis is difficult because there is degeneration of the tissue you know autolysis of the tissue and this problem is now solved by going for microarray so now routinely if you have an option there is an indication for genetic genetic testing so it is preferable to go for a microarray and not just a conventional karyotype because it can detect bit more of the genomic abnormalities small micro deletions and duplication so it is important to offer microarray in such situations however takes time you know the turnaround time is more and it may still not give you answer in all the cases but it is still worth doing all of these tests uh, in a stillbirth so at the time of diagnosis of stillbirth we do an ultrasound scan amniocentesis maternal blood test maternal toxicology maternal microbiology and after delivery we need to go for external examination infant blood test placenta membrane cord histopathology cytogenetic investigations post mortem and radiological imaging if they are uh, not agreeing for conventional autopsy so step 1 is maternal history family history step 2 is maternal investigations step 3 is stillbirth examination including physical examination clinical photographs x rays autopsy and then step 4 is the cord examination step 5 is the placental examination step 6 is the cytogenetic investigations and all of this information should be used in counseling and if no cause is found then we go for empiric counseling so now the most important part is that you know okay the stillbirth has happened unfortunately so what do we do now so first of course is counseling the emotional reaction and i think uh, in the private sector i understand you know the system is better you know prepared to handle it for us even in public sector these things are evolving so we need to understand the cycle that the woman goes through the the couple goes through the blame whether they blame themselves whether they blame the health system so we need to give them a private space in a unhurried manner breaking the news is something that we really need to do in a very very respectful manner and you know uh, with lot of empathy so we need to tell them that there is no specific cause found in many cases even if the cause is found you know we can plan for the future but further investigation may be necessary explain about the options of fetal autopsy and the complications of fetal death so help them to cope by an effective communication protocol like a co protocol where you talk uh, compassionately effectively options and decision making physical availability of caretakers and emotional support for grief education and we have started doing uh, you know we have spikes protocol also which we have uh, we, we follow in our setting where we try and you know provide adequate privacy understand what the patient knows about the condition ask the patient what level of detail she wants to know knowledge that you are about to deliver bad news empathize and summarize with what is your outline or a plan now here i'll just take a minute to you know change my ppt because this part is something that we need to know on how to manage once the stillbirth has happened now what so regarding this uh timing and mode of birth is something that we need to know so what are the recommendations for timing and mode of birth so can we wait or can we induce so this decision is dependent on the gestational age the suspected etiology maternal history and what does the woman want many women would like to have an immediate delivery some people would like to wait so immediate steps to be taken if there is sepsis preeclampsia abruption membrane rupture 
Otherwise, a more flexible approach can be discussed because the facts remain that coagulation abnormalities can occur in about 3 to 4 percent of patients with, unexpe with expected management for more than three weeks. So important to tell that nothing is going to happen for three weeks. An interval of more than 24 uh, hours from the diagnosis is associated with increased anxiety in the patients. It's not a, a pathological or a, a thing in the with the coagulation, but of course the parents, the, the relatives, the patient becomes quite anxious. And vaginal birth can be achieved within 24 hours of induction in 90% of the women with IUFT. So essential point to be discussed with women who are planned on conservative management, unlikely to come to physical harm. If a woman returns home, she should be given a 24 hour contact, serial lab testing uh, for more than 48 hours. DIC testing should be done. Uh, RCOG says that every more than 48 hours we should start. And while the seminars, there is other guidelines which say that serial testing Testing may not be very useful, but in our practice, we do something like a you know weekly testing if we are planning an expected management. Uh, <clears throat> so periodic follow-up should be taken if your patient is on expected management, including the signs, the symptoms, the emotional status, and the CBC and co coagulation profile twice in a week. Now, vaginal birth has the advantage of immediate uh, recovery, and cesarean birth may be indicated by the virtue of maternal condition. So women may request a cesarean section because of the previous experiences or a wish to avoid a vaginal birth of a dead baby. However, for all practical purposes, we should try and deliver these babies uh, by vaginal uh, delivery and not offer a cesarean section. Now, how to induce labor in an unscarred uterus? So in the second trimester, we follow a protocol of mifepristone plus mesoprostol. There is evidence to support the use for management of pregnancy loss at less than 20 weeks. So from 24 to 28, there is more limited data. So how we give MIFE is we give 200 milligram or 600 milligram orally as an adjunct to mesoprostol. And it is meso is uh, administered 24 to 28 hours after mifepristone. So mesoprostol started. So mifepristone is given and after two days, we will start the mesoprostol. So it was found that if you add mifepristone, the average duration of labor is uh, decreased by almost seven hours. For mesoprostol, there is enough evidence to say that mesoprostol is more effective than only using oxytocin. Again, if oral versus vaginal mesoprostol, there is no difference in uh, oral use of mesoprostol versus vaginal use of mesoprostol. Now, what is the dose? So typically, mesoprostol is used between 400 to 600 micrograms every three to six hourly before 28 weeks of gestation. Less than 400 grams, less than in the second and early third trimester have less than in the second trimester have less efficacy. So in the second trimester, a combination of MIFE and mesoprostol is recommended. Mesoprostol can be used in preference to prostaglandin E2 and vaginal is as effective as oral, but the vaginal has a fewer side effect. Now, what do you do in the third trimester? Now, the ideal management uh, is yet not determined. However, cesarean is definitely to be avoided and labor to be managed as per the usual protocols. So in, in a recent study which talked about different induction methods, 74 women who were diagnosed with stillbirth, oxytocin and amniotomy was the most frequently used method in the later gestational age and more favorable cervix. So if we are using mesoprost, then the dose ranged from 25 milligram to 400 milligram every four hourly. Remember, it is more than 28 weeks. So closer to, you know, term 34, 36, we, we decrease, start decreasing the dose to 25 milligram. And regardless of the mode of induction, 88% women delivered safely. If we are using a regimen of mifepristone, which is 200 milligram, we give. And if it is mesoprostol combined, less than 37 weeks, you give 100. More than 37 you gives, you give 50 milligrams. So all women had a successful induction. Of the women in combination arm, 60% delivered with mifepristone alone. So that is the effect of giving mifepristone. So this is something that we can try. NICE guidelines say that if it is less than 27 weeks, you give 100 micrograms six hourly. For more than 27 weeks, it is 25 to 50 micrograms four hourly up to 24 hours. That is six doses can be given. Again, FIGO says almost the same thing that if it is less than 26 weeks, you give 200, four to six hourly, more than 26 weeks, you can give 
uh, 100 microgram every four hourly or 25 every six hourly. So there are various regimens. What we normally use is this one, where if this is less than 27 weeks, we use 100 micrograms six hourly. And if it is more than 27 weeks, we use 25 to 50 micrograms four hourly for 24 hours. So what do you do in a previous cesarean? Now, this is always a challenge. So here, mifepristone alone can be used to increase the chance of labor significantly within 72 hours and avoids the use of prostaglandin. So mifepristone alone, 200 milligram, three times a day for two days, is the off-label use. And this is the protocol that we use here uh, also with mifepristone, which we give for three days. Of course, you have the uh, mechanical methods where... Uh, it is uh, significantly the, the uh, in a previous cesarean, mechanical methods are preferable definitely to using uh, prostaglandins. However, some of the studies have said that there is increased the risk of ascending infection, but uh, most of the people use mechanical methods for previous cesarean. Now, mesoprostol is contraindicated in women with previous cesarean delivery because of the high risk of uterine rupture. There was a, another small narrative review that said that if you use them at lower doses for women with previous cesarean, it could be found to be safer between 24 to 28 weeks. More than 28 weeks, of course, there is no role of using mesoprostol for induction of labor. So just to uh, you know talk about a simple case where she was a previous one cesarean at 24 weeks of pregnancy and she had IUD. She was a known case of chronic hypertension, no other high risk factor. So we plan for induction of labor. We give mifepristone 200 milligram BD for three days, followed by mesoprostol 200 microgram per vaginal, then 100 microgram three hourly for three doses and patient delivered after the third dose of mesoprostol. So we use mifemiso for previous one cesarean, even in the second trimester, 24, between 24 to 28 weeks, not more than 28 weeks, but between 24 to 28 weeks. So cesarean delivery should be only for <clears throat> unusual circumstances and avoided. What do you do in previous two and previous three in general? There is there is absolute risk of induction of labor is slightly higher than the previous single cesarean. And with more than previous two LSES or safety of induction of labor is not known. So this lady previous two cesarean 21 weeks pregnancy with IUD with multiple congenital malformations. So wanted termination. Uh, with IUD and uh, so in this particular situation we gave her mifepristone for three days again induced her with three doses of intracervical cervical mechanical induction with laminaria tent another cycle of cervical induction for two doses no response hysterotomy then was done in view of failed medical management so we come across all cases where you know sometimes the medical uh, management response and sometimes we then we have to give up because and all of this had enough time so we gave a break in between and this induction actually went on for more than 21 days more than three weeks and yet we could not so of course there should be adequate space when we are trying to deliver an IUFT we should have a space for companion we should have a space uh, which is away from the other woman so that there is some amount of privacy and it should be given by an experienced team is there any role of antibiotic no role of antibiotic prophylaxis when we talk about uh, management of stillbirth unless there is obvious uh, you know evidence of infection so no routine prophylaxis with antibiotics so pain relief yes this is very very important because perception of pain and anxiety is more in women with IV, uh, IUFD, here we have uh, you know a, a, a team of anesthetists who would come in and give fentanyl, and uh, of course even regional anesthesia has been offered. But before we go for that, DIC and sepsis should be uh, seen for. Uh, in the postpartum thromboprophylaxis risk should be assessed as we do routinely for all postpartum patient, and established guidelines should be followed if the patient is. Uh, needing from uh, prophylaxis and late IUFD is associated with obesity, advanced maternal age. So these women might require thromboprophylaxis. So we should keep that in mind. For lactation suppression, uh, definitely non-pharmacological measures should be employed. Along with that, cabergolin can be given. We routinely give cabergolin unless the patient is hypertensive. In that case, we do not give that. And uh, uh, in that case, we give belong. Estrogen should not be used to suppress. Uh, lactation. So cabergolin versus bromocryptin, both are very effective, but cabergolin is single dose while bromocryptin continues for 14 days. So we routinely give cabergolin here. 
So uh, in terms of labor induction, mifepristone plus mesoprostol is the first line for unscarred uterus. Efficacy of vaginal mesoprostol is equal to oral mesoprostol. Mesoprostol can be preferred to cervigel or the PGE2. Intra and mesoprostol is more effective than oxytocin also. And in a scarred uterus, we give mifepristone alone. And this is usually followed by a PGE2 gel if required. Mechanical methods can be given, but reserved for uh, clinical trials. And mostly we do use mechanical methods only. And prostaglandins are safe, but not without the risk. So just a few more things about uh, the stillbirth uh, management in the subsequent pregnancy. So we need to explain that the overall recurrence risk is increased two to tenfold, definitely depending on the cause. So uh, preterm, if there was a preterm FGR live birth, the risk of recurrence is definitely increased in this particular pregnancy. So if there was abruption, 9 to 15% risk. If it was a trisomy, then 1 to 2% risk. Autosomal recessive, 25% risk. Preeclampsia, of course, we know 10 to 15% risk. IUGR, you have a recurrence risk of 20%. So preconceptional counseling is something which is very important to review the records and see what if we can identify the risk factor, change the potentially modifiable factor and genetic counseling. Uh, we should follow the ideal first trimester protocols uh, for all of the investigations that we normally do. Second trimester anatomical survey, but most importantly, support and reassurance. Antipartum fetal surveillance should be started from 32 weeks onwards, along with, of course, support and reassurance. So we need to say that if there is no risk factor, elective induction at 39 weeks, or as per medical indication, if there is preeclampsia, ICPV, induce earlier. So uh, this was a, a very good article by Lancet, which talked about ending preventable stillbirth. So our last question comes to us is how do we prevent stillbirth? We've managed stillbirth, we've investigated stillbirth. So the prevention of stillbirth starts with the preconception where you have a good family planning, good nutrition and promotion of adolescent health, education and empowerment. During pregnancy, a good antenatal care, prevention of infections, including malaria and syphilis. And what is most important currently, what we can do is detection of late fetal growth restriction and management, of course, of maternal hypertension. During childbirth, it should be a fetal, a good fetal surveillance program and assisted vaginal delivery and cesarean section. So, of course, the quality of intrapartum care has to be very good. But what I would like to reinforce again and again is in our day to day practice. Late fetal growth restriction is something that we can detect because it accounts for 10% of all of the avoidable causes is fetal growth restriction. So just remember that this was actually a very good article in 2017, which said that first and second trimester screening strategies do not provide good detection rate for late fetal growth restriction. So a third trimester universal screening triples the detection rate of late growth restriction and this can help in preventing the morbidities and these stillbirths so and if you have to do one scan in the third trimester when will you do that scan so it should not be done at 28 weeks it should not be done at 32 weeks it should be done at 36 weeks which can detect any fetal growth restriction that has already there the late fetal growth restriction and help you to plan so I would just like to say uh, one thing when you uh, before I finish is, you know, stillbirths, we feel that, you know, there's something that can we really do anything? So this this story where there was this man who was walking along the beach along with his grandson who was throwing back all of the starfishes back to it. So the grandfather said, don't be silly. You'll never be able to make a difference. After listening politely, the boy smiled, picked up another starfish and threw it back into the ocean and said, I made a difference to that one. So if we decide you can make a difference to one family by trying to understand what happened and, you know, really helping them out in the long run. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Aparna. It was an excellent deliberation of the topic. You did justice to this topic. Now I request Professor Deepika Deka to give her expert comments. Yes, I, I, <clears throat> I'm really like so proud of Aparna. Like <laughs> little girl grown up into such a expert orator. So Aparna, you've really covered everything. So I uh, can just make a few comments. Uh, like of course, uh, autoimmune causes also uh, you have covered. 
and uh, regarding you've covered everything so much in details in such a short time so one thing that is there is the about the autopsy so <clears throat> not everybody might be having an mri and 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 it is very well known that a lot of people do not want an autopsy so therein comes the you know way how you can counsel so if you counsel them very well you tell them that we are going to give the baby back to you most of the people they actually uh, do not refuse so how well you counsel actually depends uh, upon how much you know how many patients you will get the autopsy done so one thing that we had also done aparna uh, we had done ultrasound so ultrasound everybody has and now you know with ultrasound you can better you can see much better almost like a mri you can see any defects up in something usually we do get a lot of unbooked cases also or somebody else might have done an ultrasound and not picked up and so now the baby is in your hands earlier on you had the amniotic fluid you had the placenta you had the uterus abdomen sometimes the women are very obese but now that the fetus is there using a very you know the vaginal probe because that has a very higher uh, resolution so you can do the ultrasound from head to toe you can make out ventricles you can make out coronary plexuses but of course the trick remains in whether how well you can interpret it after a macerated fetus so you have to learn the normal physiology also so one is that of course ct scan is not very useful though it's more available because many people wouldn't have an mri another thing that can be done is a clairvoyant betke test and then you know you should also look for fetal maternal hemorrhage i've learned a lot of literature now which says that fetal maternal hemorrhage is one of the important causes of unexplained stillbirths so you know you look at the baby the baby's hemoglobin it's very very important and uh, you look at other things you know how pale the baby is looking how pale the placenta is looking and of course the placental pathology you know whether there are infarcts so everybody should know how to do an autopsy and you rightly said that if you have an autopsy done you know you can really reduce the number of stillbirths to uh, the causes to almost like 1 or 2% only so these are some uh, um, inputs from my side and an excellent talk uh, as usual thank you thank you very much now i request dr raj bokaria to give an expert comments uh, dr raj are you there thank you much first to be uh, said because dr arpana has covered up all the aspect right from the diagnosis the management pre conceptual counseling in the next <coughs> pregnancy how to manage how to deliver what postpartum care everything has been detailed by dr arpana but i want to make few comments ki we as an obstetrician has a major role while we are dealing with or when we are coming across with a still but then the noting down of the uh, counseling for the fetal autopsy is very important to know the cause of the still but in where the uh, there is no clear cut cause for the still but second the amount of the like uh, noting find all these points in detail and handing over to the dentist or who is doing the post mortem is very important the um, a description the detailed description of the placenta the membrane the cord insertion they all are very important second the um, um, another point is the uh, mark is not available everywhere and the uh, other thing is ki the routine uh, antenatal checkup in the third trimester especially to pick up the early growth restriction is equally important and any pregnancy where after 28 weeks if you are losing the intrapartum still birth occurs it shows the poor thoda sa bachade ek din lucky chalenge dal banenge thodi si picture khai dr manju we need to mute this sir you should always stress upon to each antenatal patient pregnant lady about the um good observation on the fetal movement because the decreased fetal movement is also warns you is a warning sign of impending stillbirth or anything apart from the other what she has told thank you so much thank dr diti you. your expert comments 
I don't think I have any expert comments to say after Dr. Parna Sharma's talk and after the, uh, Professor Deepika Dekar's uh, comments. But as an obstetrician, just few observations of mine that an ultrasound yeah. is a must to diagnose a stillbirth. Yeah. Because you see, uh, my own experience, when the patient calls me up, she says she hasn't felt the baby movement since morning. And by the time that she reaches the hospital, the staff has started checking her and you're eating. They start telling you, Madam, nahi sunai dera, nahi sunai dera. You know, you go with such a biased mind, ki nahi sunai dera means you've lost the baby. So an ultrasound confirmation is a must before you just say by auscultation or even by monitoring electronically ki nahi the baby is silver. That is one thing I realized in my practice. Second was by waiting too late, you know, because if you just diagnosed uh, stillborn, they're not willing. They need time to accept the fact that they've lost the baby. They will not even come to you because they think you are responsible. So while they might come after seven or eight days, ki they've exhausted all the energies going here and then you are still okay. So the baby even came out was so macerated, I couldn't make out the sex of the baby. So uh, you, know, every one of us kept looking, 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 trying to imagine whether it was a male or a female. I was really very disturbed. But that is another uh, problem I faced was uh, sexing the baby. And the third I wanted to do, Dr. Parna, since we are uh, working at the center where we don't have facilities for an MRI or for, you know, ultrasound or anything in detail. So when you send the uh, stillborn child, say suppose I send it to you or to Dr. Baker, do you uh, put the baby in a formal and jar and send or how, how do you transfer okay. the baby? Normal saline. Normal, normal saline, ringer lactate. This is what I... So you can just put those parts like like we discussed. Ah, you know, and and you can, all I know, but do you have to send the baby? Send the baby. Baby, you can just send, keep the baby in the plastic fridge. bag, plastic bag, without anything. Okay. So you can keep just the baby send, in the yeah. fridge. Yeah. Um, another point. I just uh, she also talked about the delivery. I mean, usually like so. I just wanted to say that sometimes the uterus in early pregnancy are very resistant to oxytocin or any of these, yes. you know. Yes. Uh, uh, prostaglandins. So we have had on several occasions given estrogens to prime the uterus, to prime the uterus. And you know, in medical, in, in the bigger hospital setups, especially when there is previous one caesarean, two caesarean, I had a staff nurse, previous two caesarean, and she was transverse lie, and it was IUD. Uh, and I didn't really, I don't know, Panna, whether you joined that time or not. But then, you know, I said, what will happen? The uterus will rupture? I will stitch it up. You know, why do I want to give an incision beforehand? I uh, allowed her to go into labor. She had a hand prolapse. I did a destructive operation. You know, for me, I have the experience of working in Assam, where I used to do at least two, three destructive operations every day. So I was very confident and uh, saved her from a, ut uh, from a uterine scar. So <laughs> I think, you know, you can use all sorts of experiences to manage cases like that. So estrogens can be very useful to prime the uterus so, uh, um, and then we can, uh, then after that, they respond very well to whatever prostaglandins or oxytocins you give. And, and then, as, we, as Aparna said, we send the patients home, come back when the pain starts, of course, come back in two weeks. Nothing will happen in two weeks. Can I make a comment, Dr. Deepika? Make, making the uterus rupture, I don't think it will be possible in this medical legal scenario. I don't That's what I said. I said you cannot do it in a small setup. It has to be done in a medical college setup with a proper... Okay, let us stay, not even discuss that. Sorry. Let us not discuss that. And Dr. Aparna, I'm just telling you my experience? experience. Yeah. What about your experience regarding the Foley's, use of Foley's as a mechanical... Ma'am, it's very yeah. good. Yeah. We have it's used good. laminaria tent. Even yes, ma'am, and even Foley's is very good. So you have to inflate it the uterus with 30 ml of. Really works out beautifully. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It works beautifully. Yeah. So we leave it for 12 to 24 hours. It either it gets expelled on its own, and then we start syntocinol. So it's a very good the method, especially in previous cesareans, to go ahead and do the Foley. Yes. Yeah. Doctor Aparna, can I ask one question? Sorry to uh, interrupt between. Uh, Ma'am, uh, if the patient's uh, microarray and everything comes out to be normal, can we have some DNA preservation for exons if anything? Uh, yes, ma'am. No, it is, pregnancy it is definitely done routinely because, you know, exome sequencing is something that, you know, if we are suspecting something, you know, exome, we have to understand what are the limitations of a clinical 
the like you know, kind of whole exam sequencing. So it's like you are looking for an interior in hairstyle. You have a direction to look at. You know, you can really see what you are looking at. But yes, there is definitely a role in that. You know, it's a recurrent IUD which are happening. As I said, the indications for cytogenetic test. So if it fits into that, then why not go the full uh, full on and go for even a trio? You know, parental along with the fetal. That will make more sense than you know just going for that. But yes, I mean there is definitely role of giving the DNA. And some of these cases now the DNA is definitely safe. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Aparna, as usual, your presentation has been absolutely great. And I, I think uh, we all work in a private sector, so you uh, very beautifully detail what all has to be done after the uh, after the stillbirth has occurred. Now I want to repeat what she has said: is that you know, if a talk is not acceptable to them. Now I just want to tell uh, each one of you: Life Cells offers a proxy for ten thousand rupees, and um, I have had an experience in two. Uh, abortions in uh, ivf uh, patients you know in the covid times and they they provide everything you know how the uh, things have to be packed and things like that if, if they are not agree then the micro arrow must be sent i think you know for that we should definitely convince them and for that she has said that you must collect in the ringal at it uh, uh, solution and that particular part must be uh, done and uh, i i am very thankful to you it never occurred to me that you know once the child is born to an ultrasound because this is the ultrasound is going to be just like an mri you know so i think that's that's something uh, great and uh, at this uh, time i learned uh, i must tell uh, that you know you, you, there is a big role of you to respond twice a day for three days before you start mm -hmm. using them uh, as far as private sector is concerned you know these people somehow it is in their mind ki ki zehar phail jayega dic ho jayega ye ho jayega so they are not ready to take uh, the person no no they are not ready at all that's that's what my experience is in the last uh, 30 years is the whoever consult talks are you still both ho gaya iska kya kare to convince karna ki aap isko le jao kuch nahi hoga tumhare ko teen din mein they are not going for that particular thing and uh, the only thing i i tell them that you know please uh, Uh, keep your uh, finger uh, like this so you do not do a cesarean section so uh, but at times you know people have to do it but it had been absolutely great exercise and dr malti madam malti must have recorded it we will send uh, this particular recording to all of you so at least you can keep and reread it uh, two three times so thank you very much dr deepika deka it has been absolutely pleasure for yeah, you okay. I, i just wanted to add yes, one yes, more thing you know because just to complete it has been such a complete picture So when you talked about the ultrasound, you know we had done uh, several theses in the department. So we can also do ultrasound guided biopsy. Yeah. So you see, logic because when you patients don't want to have the incisions, so it is very easy to do ultrasound and ultrasound gu guided. You take in a true cut. You can easily take a biopsy when you're suspecting that there could be a problem. That two people are here, and I just want to uh, Dr. Parna emphasize. That forget about 28 weeks ultrasound. Forget about 32 weeks ultrasound. Do 36 weeks. Pick up uh, fetal growth retardation. And here, please tell them what should be the mode of induction. Please. Uh, Because they will induce patients, and the, uh, it will be still birth. Ma'am, uh, and then there will litigation will happen. So please, madam, tell them uh, about what should be done uh, if you find fetal growth retardation. What is the mode of induction? What is the mode of termination of pregnancy yes. at that time? Please. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, for this I would request one thing. I would like to take a talk on late fetal growth stage. It is a completely different entity. But yes, um, if we detect, so there is one scan which is done at thirty-six. In that thirty-six week, we will we will diagnose late fetal growth stage if the estimated fetal weight is less than third centile. Here, the umbilical artery Doppler may be normal, MCA Doppler may be normal, but the CPR is less than the fifth centile. So we know that there is a problem with the baby's weight and also the Doppler. Now, once we have made a diagnosis, we have continued monitoring by Doppler and also weekly Doppler, bi-weekly fetal surveillance by Manning, weekly Doppler and two weekly growth monitoring. Now, and induce the patient. Between thirty-seven to thirty-eight weeks. Now the question is, when thirty-seven and when thirty-eight? Now the thirty-seven will come when you have fetal growth restriction, that is, a fetal weight less than the third centile, along with an umbilical artery Doppler which is more than the ninety-fifth centile. Then you induce her at thirty-seven weeks. 
but if there is a fetal weight which is less than the third centile and the umbilical artery doppler is normal the pr is only reverse that is the less than the fifth centile then you can wait for a week and maybe go up to 38 weeks but not beyond 38 weeks so to be on the safer side if you induce growth restrictions at 37 weeks that is well justified but if you think that the cervix is very unfavorable patient is not responding to land up in a cesarean section maximum you can go up to 38 weeks dr deka you want to make any comment ma'am you have to unmute yourself unmute yourself yes the mode of delivery is what you were asking so you know it all depends upon the uh, cervix how favorable the cervix is and you have to have a very high threshold for doing a cesarean at the drop of a hat ma'am i'll uh, ajay yeah. i have i have reservations here you ma'am yes i sorry i i did not go into the mode of delivery so yes the mode of delivery as ma'am said is that we should go in and do an induction of labor like in our situation also we know she's fetal growth restriction we has uh, doppler abnormalities so we will give her a cervical maybe we give her a two cervicals and everything is all right you know the baby is doing well we actually defer the indication defer and you know wait for another day so we go slow on it we will try for a vaginal delivery but if you have an absent doppler right if you have an absent diastolic flow or anything worse there is but with stage 1 fetal growth restriction we can go for a vaginal delivery and generally here also like you know we give a good trial yes but we need to be very careful like pam said that you know we need to keep the monitoring very good you know intrapartum monitoring has to be really good madam uh, uh, let me just share with you what is my experience uh, in the delhi medical council as well as in nfc whenever the stillbirth occurs in a growth retarded fetus where the doppler changes has been there and the gynecologist induces them we find within 3 4 hours the stillbirth occurs where is the fault we do not know but you know the uh, i i feel you know these growth retarded fetuses private sector people should not play with their patients it's okay no so actually it depends upon side. how severe the growth restriction is how the dopplers are and as i said a very high threshold for cesarean i mean do the cesarean at the drop of a hat any time you find that there is a little bit of deceleration there is no, a little no. bit of break in diabetic cardiac tachycardia no. otherwise you know there is no harm if the cervix is very unfavorable take her up for an elective cesarean okay so i i think things are very clear today's uh, cme had been absolutely excellent uh, the number touched more than 100 and it had been absolutely great uh, cme uh, uh, dr jyoti baskar uh, it was absolutely grand show thank you thank you very much thank you, thank you so much, much madam thank you so much thank you ma'am thank you thank you very much